What's up guys, it's GM Max here, and I'm going to show you how to play the Queen's Gambit Declined. A very solid defense to d4, which is very easy for new players to play, but it's also been played by many of the strongest players in the world. It's where against the Queen's Gambit, rather than accepting the Queen's Gambit, we decline it with the move e6, with a very simple plan of developing our king side. For example, after knight c3 and knight f6, we're going to see a fantastic game played between Alexander Moisienko against Kasa Corley in the Helsinga Open 2019. Picture of absolutely beautiful smashing sacrifices. Now in the game, Moisienko played the exchange variation with C takes D5, which is a move that you're going to see quite a lot because it's recommended in a lot of different books. There are other approaches that White can play. For example, Bishop to G5 is one move. And now I have a fun little shortcut as well, where at this point you can actually play a move like D takes C4. And the idea of D takes C4 is that you're not really trying to hang on to this extra pawn, but instead you're releasing attention in the center. So after E C3, you can then play a move like C5 and kind of hit back in the center. For example, Bishop takes C4. You can then play C takes D4, E takes D4, Bishop E7, and just develop very solidly, getting some decent play against the isolated pawn. Another approach as well, if you don't want to give white all that space in the center, you can also play the move A6 here. And go for a plan of b5, bishop b7, knight bd7. And if black gets that in, I think this position is actually very decent. Where, it is true, you might recognize being like a queen's gambit accepted. Where the bishop is on g5 instead of c1. Which at first might seem like an improvement for white. But I don't think it makes that big of a difference. I think still after knight bd7 and kingside castles, that black would be very safe here. So there's quite a decent shortcut as an alternative to the usual bishop b7 and castles. Which is the usual way that they played it in the old days. And if I were to play knight f3, then again, you can actually play the move d takes c4 once more. Just hang on to that pawn in the Vienna. And if they play a move like, let's say, e3, then once again, we can go for c5. Bishop takes c4 and a6. And go for a very similar plan to what we just saw of going b5, bishop b7, knight bd7. And then bishop e7 and castles. It's a pretty easy plan to understand. And if they stop it with a move like a4, then we can simply take, play a move like knight c6 or bishop b7. And we're just going to develop our pieces on natural squares, you know, put the knight on c6. Our bishop will probably go to this long diagonal. And also another point worth keeping in mind is that also your knight's going to have a very good square on b4, which will allow you to keep a good hold over that, uh, well, over that d5 square. Say h6, bishop h4, knight b4. And, you know, once you get the bishop here, you're just very, very safe in this kind of position. And it's very hard for white to really whip up any sort of attack against our king. Uh, and if they do play e4, then yeah, you can play bishop b4 and pin their knights. Or if you want to play it in the modern style like Nakamura and Duda, then the move b5 is a very interesting shortcut. They have had very good results with my own games. In fact, Magnus Carlsen has a score of half out of four with this move. And the idea is that, yeah, knight b5 is running in a knight takes e4, which destroys center in that way. So they should really play e5. But then it turns out that even though you have the double pawns, it's actually not that easy for white to punish this. This pawn can always be defended by a move like bishop a6 if you need it. And if they do play a move like bishop e2, we can kind of just develop naturally like bishop e7, castles, knight c6, and you know, if bishop e3 just castles, and you're going to get good counterplay moves like rook b8. Like I said, we can defend the c4 pawn with bishop a6. Often your knight will come to a really juicy outpost on d5. So it's one of these that looks ugly for black, but actually is quite decent. Though I guess at the subject, this is probably better to go in deeper in a separate video. But I do think that the Vienna is a very nice shortcut, which has been saying some problems even for some of the world's best players recently. Well, the game sort of moves C takes D5, and after E takes D5, White usually pins the knight with bishop G5, because otherwise it's just too easy for black to get his bishop to F5 and have this very beautiful diagonal. So pinning the knight tries to avoid that. We play the move C6, just building a very solid pawn chain. And now after the move E3, this is where Casa Corley can wear a very interesting shortcut. He didn't play the usual approach of playing h6, bishop e7, and castles, but he came up with something a little bit different uh, to this usual development. He played the move bishop to d6, and at first it might seem, okay, it's a more active square for the bishop, so it might seem a lot more active than bishop e7. It does have the disadvantage that we haven't solved the problem of the pin to the knight, but it turns out we don't necessarily need to just yet. Well, again, continued bishop d3, castles. Why well, played the move queen to c2 here, uh, it's a very natural move, but I think it might not necessarily be the most precise, even though you are threatening the bishop takes h7 to win a pawn using the pin, which is one reason why I often see black put the bishop on e7, but 
It might actually be better for White to play a move like Knight to F3 here. And then if we play Rook E8 to go Castles in. Well, can I try and make the argument that this pin is still a little bit annoying? I mean, you can still definitely play a move like Bishop G4 and play like H6. And then in that case, like after you put the, the question to the Bishop. Well, I mean, after Knight F, B, D7, Black definitely has a very solid game. And well, even I do like going Bishop H5, Knight F8. And trading off the opponent's good bishop is one way to try to equalize in these positions as black. But yeah, I have to admit that probably this is the line where white has the best chances for an advantage. Probably if he plays a move queen b3, white can achieve a very small pull here. Because the pressure his pawn is a little bit annoying after he moved the bishop. Fortunately, it's unlikely that your opponent's going to notice. Because it's not really been played in quite a lot of games. Uh, well, white played a move queen c2 instead. And in this game, we're going to see Moisienko go for the other major setup. You know, the first main setup for White is the Knight F3 one that we saw just then. And the second main setup is for White to play the Botfnik setup with Knight G2. But I think that the Botfnik is a bit less effective against the Bishop D6 setup compared to the Bishop E7 setup. And the reason is that to make Knight G2 work, you really need to get in F3 and then get in the E4 push. And with our pressure from the Rook against the E pawn, obviously F3 would just leave the pawn on E3 hanging. But otherwise, it's not that easy for White to come up with a great attacking plan. And we see Moisienko, a 2628 GM, really struggled to find a good plan. Uh, if you're wondering what the idea is behind the move A5, well, there's two ideas. The first one is that you're stopping White's standard minority attack, where he goes B4, B5, and tries to break up our very solid pawn chain. And the second idea is that we clear the way for Knight A6, because now our pawns are not getting doubled anymore when we can take back with the Rook on A6. And also we're threatening Knight B4, so after A3... The knight now moves around to c7, and we see that after castles and knight e6, the knight is very flexible on this e6 square. It's one of the dream squares for black in this structure, because it means that if white does get an f3 and e4, our knight is very well placed to exert pressure on that d4 pawn. For it's actually, white did play the move f3 in the game, funnily enough, which I think might actually be a mistake in this position based on, on what happened afterwards. I do think that probably instead a better move is to play something like bishop to g3, which might seem like a weird retreat, but it does allow you to trade off the bishop pair. And to be fair, black should still probably be fine after knight g5, you know, even after trade of bishops. It's still not easy for white to get in a good move f3 because of the pressure on this pawn. And black can also, this is a very common idea in his positions, he can put his knight on e4 at some moment. You know, maybe you wait with bishop d7, but certainly you can put the knight here and then if they do take, well, you can take with a pawn and that will give you some space for a long-term attack on the white king with a pawn storm or with a rook lift. I could go deeper, but that's not what we're generally aiming for in these pawn structures. Typically, if you can get a knight to e4 and swing a rook over to attack the white king, well, you're normally doing pretty well in these positions. Uh, but instead, white played to move f3, which I think gives up his, any chance he had to fight for an opening advantage. Probably objectively, the most solid move is just to go bishop e7. Kind of just break the pin and say that white's extra move h3 doesn't, didn't help him all that much. But okay, knight g5 was how Corley played it, and it led to some very exciting play. Because actually here, white made a mistake. The best move for white is one that looks very anti-positional, but actually is quite an important move, I think, to deal with the coming attack. I think that white should play the move of f4, and when a move like f4, probably thinking, well, doesn't that just allow knight e4 and just give a monster outpost? Well, it turns out that the tactics work in white's favor. After bishop takes e4, you know, you'd like to take with a knight, but the pin on the knight to the queen is a problem. And after d4, knight g3, we see that white is basically able to win that pawn with take on f6 and take on e4, and that's just not going to be working out for black. He can't afford to lose the whole center in this kind of way. Uh, so therefore, black would have to play a bit differently. Uh, he could consider the knight h3 sack, but I don't think it quite works out here. Uh, but it's certainly an interesting try after this. I think that the move of bishop to h7, just yes, forcing the king to some weaker square. And I think that bishop f5 is going to consolidate, where the bishop is doing a good job of defending the h3 pawn and well run rook does not make if an attack as shakespeare would have said uh so i think black would have to play knight e6 but then why can so go knight g3 or even some move like king h1 i do think that objectively black is still fine but white does have some attack ideas with knight f5 which do make up for the fact he has an isolated pawn or either a backward pawn e3 so black would still have to be slightly careful even though he's still very solid you know it's one thing that's nice about playing the queen's camp to claim this is a very Solid opening, so even if you forget the theory or if you make some imprecise move, your position is usually still fairly playable and fairly robust, which is not necessarily the case with some other super dynamic openings like, say, the Grunfeld or, say, the King's Indian, where one mistake could leave you in quite big uh, strategic trouble. Well, Moisienko played e4, and it's at this point that I want to see 
if you can find the amazing idea that Casa Corley played here as Black. So while you're thinking about it, do make sure to smash that like button and leave a comment below with the move that you would have played in this position to see if you played it as well as Casa Corley. Okay, well done if you found the following move. The answer is to play the move Knight F takes E4. In fact, if it wasn't for the tactic that Black plays, White would actually be much better with ideas of going E5 and going for a very nasty fork on our knight and on our bishop. But after knight F E4, the tables are turned. I mean, White may as well play F E4 because if you don't take the knight, Black has basically just won a free pawn. You know, bishop G5, have got knight takes G5 to save the knight. So Moisenko played F takes E4, and now the hammer blow, knight takes H3, exploiting that undefended bishop. And after G takes F H3 and queen takes H4, we see that white king is completely open. The queen and the bishops are raking in on the attack. Even the rook can potentially join the attack as well. And it's just very, very hard for white to defend. You know, white's not really in time to play a move like e takes d5. Because after bishop a3, well, we're already threatening to get our material back with bishop takes f1. And if they try to defend with rook f2, we can just go rook e3. And we just bring every single one of those pieces in the attack the way that the grandmasters do. And once you have that final rook in the attack, I just don't see how black, how white survives. For example, after takes, takes, if they try to bring pieces to defense with, I don't know, knight e4 or something. Well, in that case, we can play a move queen to g4 check. Keep in mind that the g3 square is not available for the knight, because we'll simply take it. And after king h12, we have a very beautiful move to win the game by force. Well, there's more than one winning move, but the move bishop f1 is just absolutely gorgeous. The point being that there's no good defense to the rook h3 check. If you take the bishop this way, you've got rook h3... And then you've got the uh, rook h2 captures uh, with checkmate. Or if they take the bishop instead, then you've got rook h3. And then we can use the pin with our rook h2 and, and our nice queen to, to g2 checkmate, uh, as it were. So therefore, that means that white played a move rook f2, trying to get his rook out of the attack from the bishop. Still the move bishop takes h3 came anyway. And white just doesn't really have a good way to beat back the attack. You know, a move like e5 might seem quite natural in order to try and close the side of the board where he's coming under fire. But Black has a very nice tactic that allows him to basically win the game here. Again, this is a good moment for you to pause the video to see if you can find it. And also remember to subscribe to stay up to date with more of my uh, chess video lessons. Okay, there's only one winning move for Black here. And well done if you found the move Rook takes E5. The idea of Rook takes E5 is that, well, if they don't take the Rook, Rook G5 is just GG. But... If you play to take the rook, then there's the move bishop to c5. And white just doesn't have a good way to defend that rook. If you try to defend it with knight d1, black can play queen g4. And if the king were to move away, you'd take the rook and... Well, you've already got back the material because you have four pawns for the piece. But you're also threatening mate on g2. Where the only good way to avoid it is basically to resign as white. Uh, and if they play a bit differently, like say if they go knight e4 and try to attack the bishop as well as defend the rook... Well, still you can play bishop takes f2 and after knight f2 and queen g5. Again, we're threatening the checkmate on g2 if the white king were to move. But after knight g4, like black still has four pawns for the piece. He still has a continuing attack with queen to g2, king e3. And after rook e8, we're going to pick off this pawn. And, you know, with five pawns for the piece and the white king dancing around the board like it's king of the hill. Well, it's just completely winning for black. So white tried the move of rook d1 instead trying to, well, at least get some pieces developed. But in this case, there are a lot of winning moves for black. I mean, a move like d4 or giving a check on the g file would be pretty good here. But Castle Corley decided to win in the most beautiful style. He played a move rook e5. Actually, with a very similar idea to what we saw after the move pawn to e5. That, well, allowing rook g5 is just bad, bad news for white. But after d5 and bishop c5, again, white is very hard-pressed to find a good way to defend his rook. If he plays a move rook df1, we will simply take it because obviously rook takes f1 is illegal due to the pin. And if king takes f1, well, we get a queen to f2 checkmate and uh, that's the game. Of course, white can try to hang on with a move like knight to d1 or something like this. But after bishop f2, it's pretty obvious that black is just way up in material. I mean, after takes, like white would need probably to have two more pawns or even three more pawns to be okay. But anyway, when you go rook e8, and you know, once that rook and queen are in the attack, white is not going to survive very long, especially with the material disadvantage to boot, with three pawns and a rook for the bishop and the knight. Moisienko instead played knight to d4, but after bishop takes d4, it's just kind of a desperate measure. Still black is threatening queen to g3 to lure the king away, 
and to pick up the rook on f2. So I tried to defend it with rook d d2. We had to move queen to g3. King h1. And there are a lot of winning moves for black at this point. But again, black continued to play the absolute best moves. Playing the move bishop to g4. And the idea of bishop g4 is basically to go bishop to f3 check. So if they do take our bishop, well then it clears the way for a queen to g1 checkmate. And white doesn't really have a good way to deal with it. In the game he played bishop f1, but then there was bishop f3. Bishop to g2. And then after queen to h3, white resigned here. Because his gang made it on the next move. You know, obviously taking the queen would leave the, the white king in check. But after king g1, we now have the very nice move queen to g2 checkmate. Again, using the power of the pins because the rook takes g2 would leave the white king in check. So there you are, a very fun game by Kasakoli where he managed to beat a strong Ukrainian grandmaster Moisienko by playing the solid queen's gambit decline, but playing it in a more aggressive way that we saw here. Where after cd5, ed5, he decided to go for the more aggressive sub of putting the bishop on d6. And then by maneuvering his knight toward g5, he was able to punish white for playing too ambitiously and one of an absolutely beautiful sparkling attack as we saw here so yeah do make sure as always to subscribe to the channel you know leave your comments of what you learned as well from the video and i will see you guys in the next how to play the video